So this course is about teaching you what do we mean by data communications and what are the technologies that we use to support data communications. So this first topic, we're going to, I'm trying to explain a definition of data communications and some of the challenges of data communications and relate that to computer networks. So you've heard of the terms, you may know the basics, let's set the entire course up by giving an overview of data communications and networks. What do we mean by data communications? Well, communications, when we communicate, what we're really doing is trying to share information. Okay, so when I talk to someone, I've got some information in my head and I want to get that to them. So we're communicating, we're getting information from one person to another or one to uh, other people. And that's some local face-to-face -face communications. With computer systems, we often want to do that either on a local basis when they're nearby or more so uh, irrespective of the distance between the two entities that want to communicate, say across the world we'd like to communicate. So communications about getting information from one entity to another, sharing information. And that can be on a local basis or remotely. So from my computer here to a computer in the US, getting information from my computer or the user of this computer to some other user somewhere else, sharing across some distance. So we know what communications is. Well, data communications, what do we mean by data? Well, that's the information that we want to share. And there are different types of data, we have different classifications of data. For example, text, maybe uh, uh, an email we write using uh, some characters, numbers, images, audio, video. So they're the common formats or types of data that we'd like to communicate. And we'll talk about them as, as we go through this topic. So data communications is the exchange of data between two or more entities or devices via some transmission medium. So we want to get data or information from one point to another or from one point to many others in some cases, like in this lecture, it's from one point, me, to many receiving entities, you. In other cases, it's one to one or point to point. We want to get data between two or more devices and that data is sent across what we call a transmission medium, the thing between those entities that are communicating, say between me and you. So we'll talk about what we mean by the transmission medium as we go through. First, a little bit about data. I think you all know the difference between analog and digital. So we'll just give a, a, a couple of quick examples of analog data and digital data. So data is the information that we want to convey between entities. We want to get information from one point to another. We use data to, to convey that information. And we can split data into either analog or digital. And some examples, or well, analog data, an analog means something is continuously varying over time. Digital means there are discrete values. Examples of analog data, voice, so when someone's talking, Music, you're listening to music, someone's playing an instrument. Video, uh, sensor data, maybe there's, uh, we sense data from the temperature of the, the, the room. So we have a temperature, analog temperature sensor and it's continuously receiving inputs which are the temperature of the room. And we can even think of images. When we take a photo with an, an old style uh, uh, camera, is we can think of that as analog data. There's continuous changes in, in the, the light that hits the photo sensor, uh, the, the camera sensor. So a lot of our data that we deal with comes in an analog form, but we also have digital data. And in fact, most things that we actually deal with today, even if it's analog data, we convert it to a digital form. We dig digitize that data. So I say that uh, voice, music and video is analog, but I think most of you, when you listen to music, you lis listen to it which is a, uh, 
first stored in a digital form, say an MP3 file, or you, you via, sent across the internet on, on YouTube. So we may convert analog data into digital data by digitizing that. And we'll see in a later topic the, the techniques that we can use to digitize some analog data, especially voice and music. A couple of brief examples first of analog data, audio. So when someone's talking or your music, if we think of that as analog data, audio or music we think of as, or voice or music, we uh, think of when someone creates a sound, that sound can, can be represented in terms of what frequency is of the the sound or the, the audio, and what's the strength? That is, when we talk, we, people talk at different frequencies. We change the frequency of the, of the audio coming out of our mouth, and we also change the strength. Sometimes I talk quieter, and sometimes I talk louder. Okay, so that's changing the strength. What this plot tries to show, and you don't need to know the details, it shows for some different examples the range of frequencies of those examples down the bottom and the strength. So, listed as power here. Focus first on the solid green line, which is labeled speech. So, when someone's talking, this is uh, the typical range of frequencies that someone produces when they talk and the strength for those particular frequencies. So, that green line here tells us that most humans, when they speak, the frequencies that they produce are a little bit larger than 100 hertz. 100, 200 hertz. What's a hertz? A hertz is a measure of how often something changes, some cycle. And we'll, we'll redefine that, or we'll define that in a, uh, more precisely later. And also frequency. And ranges up to about 10 kilohertz, 10,000 hertz. So the audio that comes out of your mouth it has different frequencies ranging from about 100 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. But for those lower frequencies of 100 hertz, in fact, the strength is quite weak. That is, we don't usually make large or uh, loud sounds at those low frequencies or at those high frequencies. Usually it's in this area. This is when the strength of our uh, signal our voice is the highest. The dashed green line is the similar data but for music. So if you th think of a, uh, and measure different types of music, approximately they range from the frequency in terms of tens of hertz up to maybe 20 or even 30 kilohertz. Music has a higher range of frequencies than our voice. And our ears can pick that up. That is, we can hear the very high frequencies, maybe when an orchestra is playing, you can hear the very high frequencies, which you would not hear if someone's talking. And in fact, some of the very low frequencies of, of music are, are not used when we speak. So speech and music are examples of analog data. This plot shows us some other things that we're going to see through the course, maybe two that you'll recognize. When we transmit speech or music through a radio system, you listen to AM or FM radio, then those are communication systems, AM and FM radio, and they allow you to transmit a range of frequencies. And this dashed line here shows us the approximate upper limit of the range of frequencies that AM radio can transmit. What this is saying is that when you're listening to AM radio and someone's talking, AM radio can transmit frequencies up to around here, 8 kilohertz, getting close to 10 kilohertz. It can transmit almost all the frequencies of human speech. So when someone's talking on the radio, it sounds quite clear. You don't lose much quality of the, 
of the, the speech. But music has a wider range of frequencies. There's much higher frequencies than when someone speaks. And AM radio can only transmit frequencies up to a little bit less than 10 kilohertz, but music goes up to more than 10 kilohertz, maybe 20 kilohertz. So when you transmit music, you try and listen to a song across AM radio, the quality may not be so good because the high frequencies of that music do not get to be transmitted through the AM radio. FM radio is designed to support a larger range of frequencies, approximately up to what music includes. So FM radio can carry all the frequencies of speech plus most of them of music. That's why music sounds better on FM than AM. Okay, so the details of why this, uh, why the AM and FM are designed like this and, and the frequencies and so on, we're going to discuss through several topics in this course. So you don't need to know all that yet. But I think you know one thing, music sounds better on FM than on AM. And we're going to study why that's the case, what the frequencies are and, and the, the, the width of those range of frequencies. So an, an example of analog data, audio, An example of digital data. Well, this is an example of how we can convert some English characters and a few other characters into digital data or into binary. This is uh, what you may know as the ASCII table. ASCII gives us a way to convert letters or characters that we'd normally write or type into bits, into binary. The way to read this table is that if I wanted to write the message hello, uppercase H, E, L, L, O, then I can take that information, hello, and convert it into digital data, into a sequence of bits. And the way to read this table is if we consider uppercase H here, the first three bits are 100. Zero, zero, and the last four bits are 100. Zero, zero, zero. So if I want to communicate hello to you via some uh, computer uh, system, maybe I type in H-E-L-L-O, and the communication system may transmit not those five letters, but converts them into sequences of bits and transmits those bits in some manner across a medium so you can receive. When you receive those bits, you convert them back to the letters and you can understand that information. So H, in this case, could be represented by 100, 1000 in this particular encoding. There are other encodings. This one, there are seven bits per letter. But with other characters, there are different encodings defined. Anyone want, to get, anyone want to guess what that says? You can use your table, although that's slightly different than the table. In the table, there's seven bits per character. In this example, I've made it easier by separating. There are eight bits per character. But in fact, the first bit is just zero. So in, ignore the first bit of each of these, what, six the hint is there are six characters, and you can use your table in front of you to convert it back to, to English. C, S, CSS 331. Okay, once you get the first couple of characters, you can guess. How do you get that? Look at those seven bits. First three bits, 100. Zero, zero. Last four, 0011. Zero, zero, one, one. One zero zero. One zero zero. First three bits. Zero zero one one. C. Uppercase C. Okay. And then you can proceed for the others. 
So there's a slight difference. In this table, we use seven bits per character. But in my example, and much more common on computer systems for, for ASCII encoding, we use eight bits per character. We can have other encodings, but eight bits per character is very common. So the first bit was actually a zero. So it becomes C, S, S. You note those two sequence of eight bits are the same. They're both S's. Three, three, one. So this is just saying that our, we can represent our information, in this case the, the course code, as a sequence of bits. And in most of the systems that we will look at, what we'll do is we'll take our information, we'll convert it to a sequence of bits, and transmit those bits across some transmission medium. We'll send the bits to another computer system. And that receiving computer system will convert them back to the information. So now let's look at what do we mean by communication systems. <clears throat> so we want to study communication systems and, and talk about what they are. What we'll do, we'll study them by trying to uh, simplify them. There are many different types of communication systems and they are very complex. Okay? So what we want to do to understand them is to view them from a simplistic view at the start. So here's a model of a communication system that we'll use to, to, to simplify our understanding. We can talk about we, in this example model, we want to get information from one entity to another. And we'll name them the source system. They create the information. And the destination system, who we want to get the information to. So that information could be uh, anything that we want to uh, communicate. So we start, we say, with some input information. So maybe some message I want to get to some other person. This source system has two different components. The source takes the input information and converts it into data. A simple example may be, the information I want to get to someone is my name, Stephen Gordon. I know it's in my head. I want to tell someone else. If I was using a computer, what I could do is convert Stephen Gordon into a sequence of bits using, say, the encoding that we just saw and send those sequence of bits to the other person. So that's an example here of the information is my name. The source may convert that into a, uh, a format of data that is appropriate for communicating across this communication system. So we say the source starts with information and creates data. The next component is the transmitter. The role of the transmitter is to take that data and to convert it into what we call signals that can be sent to the destination. So the transmitter, so if you think the source system is, say, some computing device, the transmitter takes that data and converts it into a form where we can send across what we call a transmission si system or transmission medium. And what we send is we don't send a sequence of bits, we send signals, electromagnetic signals, for example. So when I'm talking, I'm uh, producing signals coming out of my mouth, some audio signals. We can think of those signals, um, some very varying signal strengths. Uh, when my computer transmits using Wi-Fi up to the access point on the wall, it's transmitting a radio signal. And that radio signal, going from my computer to the access point, is carrying some data. And that data is conveying some information. So if I want to send a message to someone, one form of that communication is my computer converts that into data, say a sequence of bits. Then the Wi-Fi card or chip in my computer converts that data into signals which are transmitted out of the antenna and received by the antennas up there. 
So our transmitter converts data into signals. The signals propagate through what we generally call the transmission system. And we'll see the transmission system could be as simple as a cable, uh, a LAN cable. Okay. This may be our transmission system where we'll have one device at the end. I've got a very old LAN card. This is our transmitter. It transmits a signal, some electrical signal across the wires inside this cable and it will be received by the computer at the other end point. So we can think of this could be our transmission system. This is close to our transmitter and the computer that this LAN card is plugged into, think of that computer makes up the source system and is the source. But a transmission system can be more complex than just one cable. We can view it as a collection of cables, a collection of links that we'll see shortly. But the idea of the transmission system is to get the transmitted signal to the receiver, to the destination system. If everything works well, the destination system receives a signal and then the components there do the opposite of the source system. The receiver converts the signal back to data. The destination consumes that data and has received the information. So this is our model, a simplified model of any communication system. We need to spend this course looking at especially what the transmitter and receiver does. How do we convert data into signals? What are the signals? What do they look like? And what types of transmission systems do we have? I showed you an example of a LAN cable, but there are many others. So some of the examples we'll see through the course, that, that slide just explains those four components. Some of the examples we'll see are listed here. That model can be as simple as computer to computer communications. Example, I plug a LAN cable into my laptop and the other end into this PC. Two computers, we want to communicate between them. This is our, uh, we think of this as our transmission system with respect to that model. The LAN card in my laptop is the transmitter and the LAN card in the PC may be the receiver. Another name for a LAN ca card is an Ethernet card or a network interface card, a NIC on the slide, NIC. So we have computer A and inside computer A is a network interface card. We plug the cable in or there and similar in the other computer. Not many computers have these network interfaces. They are usually embedded or uh, chips on the motherboard. This is maybe 10, 15 years old. So that's a simple example where we'd say that the computer A is the source system, computer B is the destination system, computer A, the software, is acting as the source, the LAN card or the network interface card is the transmitter, the LAN cable is the transmission system, the network interface card at computer B is the receiver in that case. Here our transmission system is a single link. Okay, there's just one cable involved. Another example Anyone have ADSL internet access at home or have used it in the last uh, recently? ADSL, hands up. You know, you have an ADSL modem, uh, maybe at home, you've used it in the last few years, hands up. Okay, many of you may use Wi Fi or 3G, but some may have ADSL in a dorm or at home. Anyone remember dial up internet access? Anyone used it? Almost getting too young, you are. But I think most people know of or may have used dial-up internet access where you had that either an external modem or a modem in your computer that made the strange noise, that, that squeaking duck noise when it connected to the other endpoint. Here's an example of that old dial-up system from a communications model perspective. It's not maybe the most realistic example, but uh, the, the, the approach was you had your computer you had a modem 
maybe a dial-up modem, maybe it was embedded in your computer or a separate device, and that modem had a telephone line going into it. You use your home telephone line to access the network. So we can think there's a telephone network from your home across Bangkok or across the city, and the other end point, you connect it to your, to your ISP your ISP server, your internet service provider's network. So that was the destination system in that case where your ISP had a modem and a server and in fact that server may even connect onto other devices, not shown here. Maybe the point of this one is that we can think of these as the source system, two separate devices. They don't have to be the one piece of hardware, they may be physically separate. And the transmission medium is not one cable, but it's an entire telephone network covering a city or a country even. So it's many cables, even wireless links. So in our, in our model, a transmission system may be a single link or multiple links. So we, what we're doing is going through examples of, that match this model. The transmission system can be a single cable or it can be a complex telephone network. The last one which we, we use uh, every day, we communicate across the internet. And a, a simplified view of that is you have your computer as a transmitter and you want to talk to a web server say in the US which has a receiving device well, what we do is we transmit information, a signal, and it goes into this magic thing called the internet. And it comes out the other side as received by the website or the web server some in the US. So we can think of computer A as the source system, computer B as a destination, the transmission system is the internet here. And I think most of you know the internet is not just one cable between your computer and the server, it's made up of a select of many different cables connecting many different networks together. So it's a very complex transmission system. This course is going to try and teach you, well, what is this internet component? How does it work? And in next semester you'll go into that in even more detail. The point of the last two is that the transmission system doesn't have to be just one link, it can be multiple links. So in general, we can draw our communication system when we use a network of links, a set of links like this. I want to com communicate from my source computer here to some destination server in the US via the internet, that we can think in general is that my source computer transmits a signal across a link, so this line represents what we call a link, to an intermediate system, maybe the access point on the wall. That's the next system that I'm going to send to, to reach the eventual destination B. Uh, no, not B, just the destination. I call this a link and I draw it as this solid line, it doesn't mean it's a cable. When I communicate from my laptop to that access point, I don't have a cable, I use wireless communication. So a link can be wired or wireless. But I send some signal to this intermediate system which will receive, maybe do some processing and then transmit a signal across a second link to another intermediate system. In this case, it's hard to see, but there's a LAN cable going from that access point downstairs into the third floor, into the computer center's network. And then there's a device there that goes to another device. And we have many intermediate systems, and eventually the server in the US maybe is linked into this nth intermediate system, which transmits the signal, it's received, it receives the data, and it has the information that I want to communicate. We call this entire uh, setup a network. We have links between devices and we create a network by using multiple links to communicate between a source and destination.
So we're having a very general introduction to what we mean by data communications and uh, introducing some of the, the structure of the systems that we're going to look at, the communication systems. So this course is going to try and teach you, well, how do we do all of this? First, we'll focus on link communications. How do I get data from one device to another device at the other end point of the link? It's not easy. There are many challenges. And some of the challenges, so if we focus on a source, a destination, a single cable or link, we transmit data as a signal, the signal is received and converted back to data. Some of the challenges is how do we do that conversion? How do we convert data to signals? What do signals look like? What are the characteristics of signals? What transmission media to use? Here, the transmission media is the thing that carries the signals. It could be some copper wires. The media can be some copper wires, which is inside this cable. And we transmit an electrical signal across those copper wires. Or it could be the air, when we transmit a radio signal from my laptop to the access point. So we need to look at the different types of transmission media wireless transmission media and wired. Wired may be copper wires, optical fibers, coaxial cables and other materials. There's a topic on that. There are different ways to convert data into signals. So we'll look at some different approaches for encoding data as signals. There are other issues like in some cases we need some mechanisms to know who's at the other end of the link, especially with wireless systems. When I transmit something, it needs to go to a particular device. But many devices may receive that transmission, so we need to identify who is supposed to get it. Unfortunately, when we deal in real life, not everything is perfect. We'll transmit a signal, but the received signal may not be identical to what was transmitted. Same as when I talk, I'm transmitting a signal. That signal, that audio comes out of my mouth, it actually goes into the microphone, some wireless communications through the cable, some wired communications, wireless from the transmitter in my pocket to the receiver in the cabinet, through wires to the speakers, and then wirelessly to your ears. So in fact, multiple links there. What you hear is not identical to what comes out of my mouth because of there are different components that may introduce what we say errors or, or noise into the system. And in fact, in this case, there's some amplification as well. Especially when we have errors. I transmit something. What you receive is not the same as what I transmit. So maybe you uh, do not understand the information. That's an error. How do we deal with those errors is something that we need to study. And a few other issues that we'll study through the course of how to set up and, and do effective link communications. But nowadays we want to communicate not just with someone who can be reached by a single cable or a wireless link, but we can communicate across a network. Even if we can do link communications, there's still challenges of how to communicate across a network. Sorry, wrong button. Even if the link communications work, if my source wants to get data to the destination, it needs to go via a set of intermediate systems. Which ones is one challenge. I want to send data from my computer to this, a server in the US. There we say many different paths through the internet to reach that server. Which path should my data take? Which intermediate system should it go via? How do we configure those intermediate systems to effectively send the data to the right destination. What happens if I transmit data and maybe this intermediate system B receives it but then fails? It's a computer, computers fail. How do I deal with those failures? And maybe the last thing we'll touch upon in this course is you want to create an application that runs on the source and the destination. 
How could you as a programmer write an application such that you don't need to know about all of those details of the link communications and the intermediate systems? So we'll look at uh, some techniques to support that. So that's an introduction to our course. Through this semester we're going to start by looking at how to do link communications. It would take us up to a little bit after the midterm and then we'll start to look at how do we communicate across a network? Things like routing, forwarding, how to find a path through the network. And close with a, some brief examples of how to support applications in the internet, create internet applications. We'll answer some of those questions or fill in some of those question marks of what should be there. quick introduction to data communications before we move on we've got a, a few other examples but any questions everyone's taking notes not playing games it's easy okay many notes to take And in fact, even if you don't understand what, what is a signal, I'm sure you have questions. What is a signal? What does a transmitter do? How do we represent data? Well, that's what we're going to study in the course. The, the topics are going to uh, try to answer those questions. Today is just stating the problems and questions. Before we get into some of the details of link communications, a couple of other things. Back to information, data and some types of applications that you're aware of. We said data communications is about getting information from one entity to another. Okay. Let's look at information and look at maybe some characteristics of information that we know about. So the information may be contained in a web page or in an email. I send an email to someone giving them some information or I watch a video, that video, that movie is some information that's coming from the, the producers of the movie and the director and the actors to me, okay? some entertainment for example. One thing that we want to know about when we design and analyze communication systems is how well they work, especially how well they perform. And one thing that we need to care about is, well, how much information do we need to communicate? So. As a simple introduction to that, how much information is contained in a web page? So I say, how big is a web page? Anyone have an answer? How big is a web page? If that's the first quiz question, what will you answer? How big is a web page? In terms of what is maybe the first question, in terms of how would we measure information? Bits and bytes. Okay, first thing, how do we measure information normally? Well, in computer systems we measure it using the units of bits. How many bits? So if I say how big is a web page, I'm looking for an answer in a number of bits. But we can also use bytes. Remember how many bits in a byte? Eight normally. Okay? One byte is eight bits. Remember that? So we measure information in bits or bytes. So I would like to know, or we'd like to be aware, well, if I want to get information of different types from one entity to another, how much information do I need to transfer? What's a typical size of a web page? Anyone want to guess? Again? Five to 10 megabytes. Some web pages, not many would be that big. I think that's too big. Five to ten megabytes. I think it, and we'll see an example. Web, what is a web page? Anyone created a web page before? Anyone seen one before? Okay, what are they? Well, I think you know that the, the core is some HTML usually, some text that defines what, what is shown on the page. 
but web pages also contain maybe some images, some, some animations, some, some uh, videos and so on. How big is, say, here's the SIT homepage. Let's see how big it is. So I've visited the SIT homepage. Well, one thing I can do, so we see it's, and we'll see shortly, it's, the core is a HTML file. It sh tells us what content should be displayed on the screen. But we'll see that this web page not just contains one HTML file, it also contains images, uh, th these animations or these um, scrolling text and so on, maybe s separate components. So I'll save that, uh, save the page as SIIT. And just note here, I'm going to save the web page in complete. Save that and let's have a look. Anyone want to guess how big it is? 500 KB. Nice guess. There's a core HTML file. I've named it sit.html. It's 400, about 400 kilobytes, 419,249 bytes. My computer tells me when I save the file, that's how many bytes. And I can times by eight to get the number of bits. So 400,000 bytes, 400 kilobytes about. But the HTML file doesn't contain everything of that web page. There's also some other files. There's a lot of JPEGs, images of buttons, of uh, GIFs, of the banners and so on. So there's a lot of other supporting files. Style sheets, JavaScript and so on. In total, wrong one. If you can see down the bottom, I'll show again so it's up the top. That folder of many other files is about 1.2 megabytes. So the HTML file, the HTML file is about 400 kilobytes. All the other files, 1.2 megabytes. So in total, about 1.6 megabytes. All right, five to 10 is a little bit too big. Is every website the same size? Web page? No. Okay, you can have smaller and larger depending upon the content. But we're talking in the order of tens of kilobytes to maybe megabytes. How big is a photo? Maybe you take a photo with a nice camera. How big is it? One, one or two megabytes? All right, so it depends on the camera, depends on different factors. What does it depend upon? Pixels. What's a pixel? Pixels are dots. And what a, 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 a digital photo is, so when we take a photo and save it in binary, we have a dot, many dots. We have dots across and dots down, so we have some resolution, the number of dots across and down, so pixels. So the resolution determines how many pixels are in the photo. Each pixel is a color. So it's displayed as a single color. And the way that photos work normally is that a pixel is one of many colors. And to save that on disk, that color is given a number. Okay. And that number is stored in binary on disk. So we can, if we know something about the resolution and the uh, number of uh, the, the number of colors, we can determine the size of a photo. Another example. Where is it? I have an example I've taken from somewhere before. A photo of Pluto from NASA. And we'll see the details, so it's just a photo of Pluto. Uh, and my image viewer down the bottom, it may be hard to see, but across, and if you zoomed in, you can see the dots, the pixels. Across is 1,920 pixels, and down is 
1080 pixels. So we say the resolution is 1920 by 1080. That's of this particular photo. And each dot, each pixel, is represented uh, or is a color, and that color is saved on disk as a sequence of bits. And it's common to use what we call 24 bit color. That is, every pixel is represented in 24 bits. Because we usually have three colors, say red, green, and blue, and each are represented in eight bits. Every pixel is 24 bits. How big is this photo? Let's calculate and then see why it's that. How many pixels are there? 1,920 1, across, 1,080 down. So that's the number of pixels in the photo. Every pixel is represented by a 24-bit number. That represents the color. And that's common with photos. It doesn't have to be very common. So that's the number of bits in this photo. We can convert bits to bytes, divide by 8. 6,220,800 bytes. 6.2 megabytes is the size of this photo. And if you see down the bottom, the, my image uh, software shows 6.2 megabytes. So this photo is 6.2 megabytes. What else may determine the size of a photo that you store on disk? Compression. The algorithm that we use to encode that information. In this case, the, we calculated the number of bits and the, the file format stores them as is. There's no form of compression. But there are algorithms that allow us to compress the information and store it in less number of bits on disk, but effectively storing the same information. This file was saved in what we call the TIFF format, and it was, had no compression. So the, this is the calculated files, number of bits, and it's about 6.2 megabytes. There's a little bit of overhead there. Yes. Mm. Take a picture with your phone or your camera, yep. Right, you take a picture with your camera and it's the same, you set your camera settings to be this, the resolution, you can specify the resolution or it's a characteristic of your uh, camera. So in theory, when you save different photos, they'll be identical size. But you know they're not. I think when you say take different photos, you'll get different size files. That's because your camera doesn't normally save the data in its raw form like we see here. It compresses it. This format is the TIFF format for the image. This one is JPEG. You see the difference? TIFF, JPEG. Up the top, JPEG, TIFF. Effectively the same image, but JPEG defines a way to compress that information. And the size of the JPEG is 131 kilobytes. The uncompressed form was 6.2 megabytes, but compression algorithms allow us to reduce that and get effectively the same image. So let's say you take a second photo, the TIFF in theory would be the same size, 6.2 megabytes, but then you compress using JPEG, you may get a different size, not necessarily 131 kilobytes, because the way that most compression works on photos is that it depends upon the colors in the photos and, and what colors each neighbor pixel is. In this case, it can be compressed a lot because many pixels are black. So instead of just having 24 bits for each black pixel, you can have an algorithm that determines, OK, there are simply 1,920 black pixels. You can store that information in much smaller space. But the amount of compression depends upon the, the colors in that, that photo. 
So that's why you get different size filings. We're not going to study compression, but we will look at other types of information. And we just need to be aware what, how much information we'd like to communicate with different systems. One more song, an audio CD. We'll, we'll look at that in a later topic and look at how much music can be stored on an audio CD. How big is a TV show? You watch a one hour TV show, how big is it? Two gigabyte, one gigabyte? Again, it will depend. What will it depend upon? Resolution codec. So remember, video, like a TV show, video. When we say video, we normally mean two things, the actual video and the audio. Okay, the, the audio is the, the sound plus the, 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 the picture. What is the picture of video? Well, it's multiple photos or multiple pictures, but changing on a frequent basis to look like motion. So a video is similar to our photo, has a resolution and a number of pixels, but that picture changes many times per second. So we also have a frame rate, for example. Last example, I think, for today, to finish off, let's look at the size of a TV show. And where will I find a TV show? Pirate Bay. OK. Here's a TV show. And don't worry, I'm not going to download it. It gives them information about the, the TV show. Zoom in a bit. Of importance here is it tells us some information about the content, the information store. The entire file is 4.29 gigabytes, or exactly this, this number of bytes. We'll zoom in a bit more, I think we can see. But the details of the video are important. So remember that the TV show in this case contains a video stream, so the video component, and also an audio stream, the sound. Let's just focus on the video part. And in this case, the video, there's a lot of details here. The duration is 53 minutes, 38 seconds. The bit rate, which we'll use in a moment, is this 10.8 megabits per second. The resolution of the video, 1,920 1, pixels by 1,074. And the frame rate is this 23.976 frames per second, about 24 frames per second. The way that it works in the raw form of video is that we have a an image and it has a particular resolution, particular number of pixels and then in this case every second we change that image 24 times. So an image is called the frame and a frame rate of 24 frames per second means that we change that image so we have 24 different ones every second such that it looks like there's motion. That's what a video is. So let's calculate in that case how many bits do we need to store that video? Bring up my calculator. We have 53 minutes. Let's convert to seconds, okay? 53 minutes, convert to seconds, plus the extra 38. So that's the number of seconds of video that we have. 3,218 seconds, and every second we display 24 frames, okay, so, and a frame will be an image. So that's the number of seconds. The number of frames that we have, well, that's the number of seconds times by 24. This is the number of frames in the entire duration of the TV show, 77,000 frames. A frame is just an image. An image has a particular resolution. What is the resolution? 
1920 by 1074. So we want to know how many bits in the video. First, how many pixels? That's the number of frames. The number of pixels, 1920 times 1074. These numbers here. That's the number of pixels in the video. What's a pixel? It's a dot represented by represents a particular color. And let's say we use the same scheme of 24 bits per, per pixel. Normally a pixel has three colors, like red, green, and blue, and different shades. Uh, we combine them in different manners. And each of those three colors is represented by eight bits. So we get 24 bits per pixel. So the number of bits we times by 24. That's the number of bits in my TV show. Let's make it a little bit easier. Convert to bytes. What is that? That's kilo, mega, giga, 477 gigabytes. Okay. The raw video is about 477 gigabytes. Now this is not compressed. So if we didn't apply any compression algorithm and stored the raw video, it would take up about 477 gigabytes. I think some of you saw the file size was not 477 gigabytes. It was, what, 4 point something gigabytes. It's compression. With video, we normally don't save every pixel on disk. Amongst the sequence of frames, many pixels don't change. So compression algorithms allow you to save that information in a much smaller space. And the compression algorithm, or the codec in particular, here the codec, we use MPEG-4 and a particular form AVC, the Advanced Video Codec, to effectively compress that 477 gigabytes down to about 4 gigabytes. And it would depend upon the content of the video of how much compression. Different sources have different compression ratios. To finish, this gives us the average number of bits per second after compression. Let's use that. We have the number of seconds again. Three thousand two hundred and eighteen seconds. And this the, the reason I went to this web page is it gives us a lot of details about the video. And it says it's ten point eight megabits per second. Mega let's times by a million. That's the number of bits per second, uh, sorry, the total number of bits after compression. Divide by 8 gives us what? Divide by, convert to giga, 4.3 gigabytes. So the first calculation I did was if there was no compression, the raw data. We saw about 477 gigabytes. But most videos use a codec that applies compression, and it brings it down to about 4.3 gigabytes, about 100 times smaller than the original. 4.3 gigabytes is the video. That matches here. Here it says, what? Uh, we need to be careful sometimes that the GI for giga, 4 billion 600 million bytes, we got about 4.3, here's 4.6. What's the rest? There's also audio in this file. The file stores video of about 4.3 gigabytes and about 300 megabytes of audio, the, the soundtrack. And that gets our video file. The course is not about how, to, how videos work, how photos are stored, but this, these examples are about well, how much information do we need to communicate across communication systems. 
It depends upon what type of information. Do we need a system that supports web browsing or to support video transfer? They'll have different requirements in terms of the performance. I think two or three slides, so let's finish with them. The information that we communicate in a communication system, we can split it into different types. One split, or one classification, is we talk about audio information, audio data, voice calls, streaming radio, music, audio only. Video, which is the, the, the motion picture, plus audio usually, so video conferencing, two people talking across Skype or similar. Video streams, watching YouTube. And the other is data, like instant messaging, sending emails, web browsing, logging into servers, accessing databases, many different types of applications related to businesses, games, monitoring different computing devices and so on. Many, many types of applications, which we just group together and say they are of type data. So there's a little bit of confusion here in that all of these are types of data, but sometimes with applications we distinguish between audio applications, video applications, and data applications. Why? Because they often have different requirements in terms of communication systems. We saw just briefly, briefly video usually requires much more information to store and to transmit as opposed to a web page which is much smaller. So we need to deal with that with communication systems. When we design and select a communication system, we need one is, that is effective, that works well. And three basic measures of what is effective data communications. We need the data to be delivered to the correct destination. If the source sends the data to destination B, but destination C receives it, that's not effective data communications. So the example that I've used in the past, you want to send a message to some, some person and show that you really love them. Okay, so you type in an email saying, I love you, and you press send. And the internet, the communication system, delivers it to someone you don't really like. That's not effective communications because the wrong person has received your love message. Okay? So we need it, of course, to be delivered to the cor correct destination. We need accuracy. I type in my message, I love you, and I press send, and my computer sends but there are some errors in the communication system and that person I sent it to does receive it, is delivered to the right destination, but the words have changed and it says, I hate you. Okay? Again, ineffective data communications. The, the message received needs to be accurate. It contained the same information as what was to be transmitted. And timeliness. I send now, I love you, and it's delivered to my friend one year in the future and she's already married so we need the message to be delivered in a reasonable time so timeliness is the other measure what is reasonable time how much accuracy depends upon the types of applications Many applications we use on the internet, like web browsing, email, instant messaging, downloading files. Accuracy is very important. I download a file. The file is 4.3 gigabytes. I download it, I spend some time, I get it, and I get those 4.3 gigabytes, but they are different from what the original file was. What's received is not the same as what was sent then I can't watch the file, there, there is, or I cannot use the file. Unless maybe that file is video. Because in some applications, the accuracy is not so important. So multimedia or real-time applications, audio, video streaming, 
even if I download the file and there are some errors in it, I can still watch it. But what may happen is it shows up as some, some poor uh, video in certain, certain components. My point to finish, different applications have different requirements in terms of accuracy and timeliness. And through this course, we'll, we'll mention those in more detail. That's a good place to stop. <laughs>